afternoon, we're going to focus on COVID and lessons learned and how folks are managing to work in an, a pandemic through the oil spill prevention preparedness and response work we do. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to our first session in just a moment, but um, a few reminders. Um, if you want to read the bios of the speakers from this afternoon, as well as this morning, there is a link to the bios in the chat. Um, I may ask uh, my colleague Melanie to pop that in again so it's uh, closer to the top, as well as the agenda for this afternoon. Also, if you have questions for the panelists or the presenters today, please just put those in the Q&A and we'll use the chat function for anything other sort of housekeeping or other kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one or to group conversations you want to have on the side. But when I'm scanning for Q&A this afternoon, that's where I'll look is in the Q&A box for questions for our speakers. Um, we'll have three sessions. The first one is being moderated by me, or myself, and I'd like to invite me, Erwin, and Mike Greenberg to share the screen with me. And uh, I will let them carry on and present uh, working in the time of COVID-19, an overview. Take it away, guys. Hi, everyone. Mike Greenberg, Oregon DEQ. I'm calling you from Portland, Oregon, which is the uh, former homeland of the Multnomah people who our, our county is named after. Um, the remnants of those people were incorporated into the, the tribe, the Grand Ronde tribe. Um, I was also asked to um, comment a little on my background uh, drop, which is what happens when you don't put the fifth, uh, the pin in the fifth wheel of your tanker truck and you take off from a stoplight, um, you leave the tanker behind, which slams down on its landing gear, puncturing the tank and spilling 1,200 gallons of hot asphalt into our stormwater draining system here, and which is awfully difficult to get out. Any case, I'm going to proceed on with discussions of, um, could we bring the matrix up, please? Great. Okay, so we asked all the, the jurisdictions to put together, um, you know, what they're doing under COVID and, and what, uh, what changes uh, that they're experiencing in response and exercises. And I don't think you're going to find uh, too much startling information here, but it is just nice to, to get a comparison. Um, so as you can see, we've all done pretty much standard practices, um, revising protocols, implementing physical distancing, using masks and other PPE, minimizing people on site, minimizing any attendance at an, an incident command post. <clears throat> we differed quite a bit. Uh, virtual ICP for response um, in Oregon, we are really just trying to minimize any response. I've only been responding uh, to two incidents so far in the field personally. Um, uh, wildfires kicked that up a little bit. We've had to have more of a field presence, but we're still really trying to minimize. I know, for instance, um, um, some of the other states are, are having more active field presence than, than we are. Could we see the next slide, please? Okay, we in Oregon, we had planned um, for uh, to attend all our degrees, our uh, sorry, our exercises virtually. Um, COVID and then wildfire forced us into a different posture. So we had seven drills during this period. Um, six of them were granted credit, um, four virtually, which without our participation, and, and two during alternate um, credit, like a performance of the the marathon response was given credit. Uh, it looks like all the other um, groups have been doing some form of remote virtual attendance on, on most of their exercises. I'm not I'm seeing a blank on Hawaii there. I um, didn't know what the end result there was. Um, and we did have one facility that we had postponed uh, the exercise for the following year. Next slide, please. So um, I know that some practices have been changing too since we've created this. Uh, in Oregon, we're still uh, not permitting shared use of vehicles. I think that's been changing in some jurisdictions under specific circumstances. Um, I think with regard to response that that's really pretty much a standard protocol that we one person per vehicle. I know that contractors are not necessarily following those protocols. They're sometimes allowing up to two people per vehicle. Um, others are using pod type structures where everyone's allowed to kind of congregate, but yet when they're off duty, they're still together and they're not being exposed to other individuals. Of course, everyone is using office cleaning sanita uh, sanitation protocols. Um, we have different levels of uh, response and operations on uh, vessels on the water. Oregon doesn't typically get in, in a vessel, but if we do, we're going for distancing. 
which sometimes requires a special boat to be deployed so that we're not around other workers. Um, other folks are continuing on uh, under their normal protocols. And of course, we've all are amending our business plans and our COOPs, our continuity of operation plans. That's been very vital during this period. And uh, we've all pretty much been reactively reaching out to our contractors. Yeah, we have been, as you can see, and kind of asking what are their capabilities and how are they changing under these conditions. And uh, of course, we'll all be documenting lessons learned on the end of this. Next slide, please. Um, other things, what, what kind of unique approaches have we had? Um, British Columbia, they activated their uh, Department of Operations Center virtually for the first time to support spill response. And uh, one of the things we did was we purchased a, a, a mobile shelter. This is just both for promoting um, social distancing under COVID, but we also realized that it would be a good piece of equipment to deploy on future events where we, even if we're not under COVID, just to have extra workspace. And that's a very nice, sturdy, uh, it's made by Western Shelter. It is um, very thick skinned, very strong construction, and it gives us a 20 by 30 space where we can set up workstations. Um, Washington, as they, they mentioned earlier, they are experiencing uh, furloughs and hiring freeze, and I think some other um, states are, are facing that as well. Um, and I, I think I'll leave that last point for, for Nee to comment on, because um, she's going to get into the discussion of exercises and drills in more detail. And I think that's the last slide. Can we check that? Oh, no. yes. Okay. Um, so I'll turn it all over to Nee Irwin with the Washington Department of Ecology. Thank you. Great, thanks, Mike. I'll uh, wait until my slide comes up here. Thank you. Um, so one of the areas that I um, wanna highlight today, um, just really quickly, because you're gonna hear a little bit more detail um, in the two sessions following um, this one, um, is to focus a little bit on the areas of how we've been connecting to get our work done, um, as well as um, sort of some unintended benefits, you might say, from um, COVID, if, if there were any to highlight um, in terms of our stakeholder work. Um, so at the beginning of all of this, as you can kind of see from my uh, slide here, um, this is just a few of the platforms that we um, are all trying to use and work and have implemented in our organizations to try and stay connected um, and to get this work done on a, in a virtual way. And I think for um, those of you or those of us who have um, maybe been positioned to do remote work prior to COVID, um, this transition was probably less painful um, but I think even in the level that we um, are working now, uh, we certainly have really uh, taxed the IT systems um, all over. Any one of these um, systems here are um, you know, changing and shifting to the demands of the users, um, improving and, and you know, making the platforms work um, at the level that it's being pushed at now. Um, and certainly, as Tom Colin <laughs> mentioned earlier, sort of just the mental fatigue of uh, being on the blue screen all day has probably really been very taxing on all of us. Um, but I, I think for the for the most part, though, um, the transition has been probably fairly difficult for a lot of organizations. Um, if you're an organization that did not have remote work as an option prior to COVID, um, this transition was probably uh, wrought with a lot of unknowns. Um, as an employer, I'm sure you wondered how this work was going to get done remotely. Um, were uh, the employees going to stay engaged? Um, could they be productive working from home? Uh, certainly looking at the challenges of what platform to use to continue to um, collaborate uh, with not only your stakeholders, but also your teams. How do we stay connected with each other? Um, from a regulatory standpoint, a lot of the work um, that is normally done uh, with that requires in-person observations, uh, work such as uh, drills and incidents, um, how are we going to maintain that? How are we going to uh, maintain um, fulfilling that requirement? And um, where were those things, um, how were those things going to occur? And as you can see from 
Mike's uh, table there, um, it was a lot of delays. So early on, we delayed a lot of drills um, as people were trying to figure things out. Um, and as time has passed, we're going to hear a lot more about the innovations that's coming up. Um, but so those are just a few of the challenges that we have. Um, and just as an example, um, within the Department of Ecology, uh, certainly the transition has not been um, the same for every environmental program within our agency. Um, the the uh, spills program, I think, has uh, been a better positioned um, to go remote work. Uh, we've been working at it uh, for probably the last decade, um, always keeping in mind um, that we have wanted to create a more mobile workforce. And so we got tooled up to have laptops. We all have hotspots. We have cell phones. We have MiFi's. Um, we have the ability to connect with our data systems. Um, and so, you know, we, um, at some small level, um, were already using virtual meetings to connect with our um, coworkers and some of our stakeholders. Um, but even that, I think in, in this time of COVID has really uh, pushed on the many limits of our state IT systems um, and in order for us to sort of continue working smoothly and in, in a virtual environment. Um, next slide, please, Caleb. Um, so a little bit about where we're at now. Um, I think the longer that we've been in this uh, remote environment, we have certainly learned a lot about the tools that work and the ones that don't work. And um, in conclusion, there's not one tool that is going to fit all, all, uh, all organizations or even all types of situations. Um, and so we're continuing to um, explore those options and work together to ensure that we um, can continue to connect. Um, there's probably been some um, unintended benefits, um, if you can call it that, in terms of this time. And we're seeing it in the areas of our stakeholder engagement. Um, so meetings such as the annual meeting, I mean, we've had, I think, over 250 people registered and I think off and on have had over 200 people online. Um, these meetings uh, originally, I think probably at most, probably 150 in person, which is pretty impressive. but certainly the range of uh, accessibility has been far reaching. Um, our, um, this year's Sailor Sea uh, Open Waters Forum, um, also uh, highly um, attended as well. Um, all the webinars that have occurred uh, in Washington, the modeling, risk modeling workshops have been uh, well attended for sure. Uh, even for as many as we've put on, they've been uh, very well attended. Uh, we've seen more attendance at our rulemaking uh, webinars as well, um, area planning meetings. Those have continued to be um, uh, well attended um, and people are engaged. So in terms of, of, of the virtual aspect, um, there's been uh, just uh, the accessibility has not only been where the location, the locale is, but it has made it accessible to people across the country, as well as some, in some cases, internationally. The content now becomes much more accessible to everybody. Um, we certainly have seen an increase in participation from our tribal partners. Um, I think that we know about the challenges of resources and budgets for traveling. Um, that has been um, a, you know, a, a, a problem. Um, and a challenge for the tribes. And I think since everything has gone remote um, and virtual, uh, we definitely have seen um, their accessibility to, um, to those meetings um, increase tr uh, tremendously. So we're very happy um, about that. And um, of course, part their participation is crucial to our work. Um, and in, in just in terms of developing best practices for virtual drills, um, you'll hear um, in the next session on that. So I'll leave it at that. But Lots of innovation that's occurring now that we're learning our systems, learning what works, um, having people practice um, using some of these different form, uh, platforms. Um, so we're, we're definitely getting a little bit more comfortable in, in this virtual environment for drills. And as we continue to work in this environment, um, we're gonna learn and, and adopt, uh, adapt and innovate as the COVID conditions and restrictions change in our prospective states. Um, and there's just a lot more that we're going to continue to capture as lessons learned um, and improve from, from that point on. Uh, so in closing this, I just want to say that um, we've gained some insight, whether we wanted to or not, or even if we were planning on thinking about doing more virtual drills, we have definitely been all thrown into this 
uh, uh, experiment. And um, coming out of that, I think that it has offered some um, innovations um, in a way that we uh, shouldn't ignore. And when and if we uh, get back to what the new normal is, um, these innovations and best practices and tools that everybody has developed is not going to go away. It's, it should be um, integrated into our work. And if anything, it will continue to enhance the work that we do now and um, into the future. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back to Sarah um, and answer any questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Nee, and uh, thank you, Mike. Both Mike Greenberg and Nee Irwin are coordinating committee members on the task force and I uh, appreciate your efforts in pulling together that, that overview. Um, just a quick note, the document that Mike shared will be available in the chat. And also we would love to hear from you if you have some best practices and also some lessons learned uh, from operating in the realm of COVID. Um, we would love to expand our table to include information from other folks and do by all means send us your, your thoughts on that either through the chat or you could reach out to me um, via email later and we can incorporate and bring in your thoughts. Um, I don't see any questions at the moment in the Q&A or uh, Mike. So I think with that, we'll move on to the next session.